A branch swiped across Eric's face as he made his way clumsily through the moonlit forest. The small cut it left would normally be a cause for him to stop and check it, but tonight he didn't care. His hand instinctively went to the pistol in his pocket to just make sure it was still there. All of it. The pain. The embarrassment. The depression. Would all be over soon. His mind and body pushed on to dark places as he took step after step into the old growth forest. He hated this place. His parents had come here to try and get away from all the troubles he was having socially with school and his friends. As far as he was concerned, all it did was isolate him in a small house in the middle of nowhere with no other company other than them. Up ahead and to the left, he saw a break in the trees. It looked through the undergrowth that it was a meadow. That seemed as good a place as any, he thought, and moved towards it. When he reached the edge of the clearing, he saw the moon overhead, bathing the area in soft, pale light. That seemed as good a place as any, he thought, and moved towards it. When he reached the edge of the clearing, he saw the moon overhead, bathing the area in soft, pale light. It would have been a perfect place to do it, if not for what he saw in the middle of the open space. Though it was hard to tell for sure, it looked like a young woman standing, surrounded by a pack of large black dogs. Blinking to try and force his eyes to focus through the dark, he strained to get a better look at the dogs, if you could call them that. Their fur was dark black, and he couldn't make out any details of their bodies. They seemed almost more like void spaces than living beings. The woman was down on her knees, facing away from him. From the way she winced at the movements of the prowling dogs, it was clear to him she was in danger. Taking the pistol out of his pocket, he raised it above his head and shouted, Hey! Get away from her right now! He felt stupid as soon as he shouted at them. He knew the words were going to be less important than the emotion in his voice, and it was all he could think to say. Even the best trained dogs could only vaguely understand complex human commands from a stranger. It's not like wild dogs or wolves could understand human language and obey. But then, they all stopped pacing around the woman and started to walk away from her. As they did so, the black forms of the dogs took on a new, disturbing dynamic, as one by one, they turned, glowing red eyes towards him. Some glanced at the woman and then returned their gaze to this new intruder. A low growl escaped from the throats of at least half of them, and Eric was beginning to think he had made a huge mistake. Looking now, he saw that there were 13 of them. He wasn't even sure the gun had that many bullets in it. The woman slowly turned as she rose from the ground to look at him. Her clothing consisted of a long flowing dress that seemed almost radiant in the moonlight. Her wide eyes fixed on him, and her mouth was slightly agape. The thought of this being a mistake were obsolete now. He had to try and save her from these things. Go on! Get away from her! Leave! They took a handful of steps back and paused again. Keep going! I don't want to see you, got it? Get out of here! At this, a low rumble of growls bubbled out of them, and one by one, they dissolved into a black mist that clung to the ground in small pools of darkness. As he watched, they began to stream away in whatever direction was closest to the edge of the meadow. As they went, they never took their glowing eyes off of him. He began moving towards the woman, and as he got close, he saw a faint shimmer and scarce his breath with a glow in the air around her. It drew his eyes down to see she was standing in a circle of mushrooms. As he approached, she raised her hand to shield her face from him and squinted. Please, she said with an exotic accent. Please... Don't come closer. Why not? He asked. She backed to the edge of the circle away from him, glanced around as if considering her options. I am... She replied. He waited for a moment and said, Yes? Her shoulders slumped somewhat and she turned her face away from him. I am afraid. Of what? Those dog things seem to have gone now. She lowered her hand and squinted as she turned her face towards him again. I am not afraid of those hunters. They cannot harm me here in this circle. Well, if they can't, then what are you... Oh, of course. He looked around to make sure the dogs had gone and then put his gun down to the ground in the tall grass. There. Feel a little better now? She looked at the patch of grass where he put the gun, then back to him. No. Okay, he began. What if I step over here away from that? She watched as he slowly and carefully got some distance between himself and the firearm, then repeated, No. 
You're kidding, right? What else is there to be afraid of? He asked, spreading his arms. Do you really believe one of my kind would be so foolish as to jest with a being such as yourself? What do you mean? She reached out a finger, hesitantly, and pointed it to him. You. I am afraid of you. He was taken aback by that. What? Why would you be afraid of me? Do not mock me, she said. I am trapped. If I leave the circle, the hounds will have me. If I stay, I am at your mercy. At least with you, there is some chance I may yet live. You know this. Allow me some dignity. He saw a single tear roll down her cheek. Now he understood that, even though she was putting a strong face in it, she was terrified. Feeling the tear, she turned her head away to hide her face from him again. When she did so, one of her ears escaped her hair. It had an elegance that ended not in the familiar round shape of a normal ear, but in a noticeable pointed tip. Eric had heard from the local grocery store owner, an older woman with frizzy grain hair, a kind smile and a mischievous twinkle in her eye, that the woods out here had fair folk in them. He had just figured she was being friendly and was a few sandwiches short of a picnic. He was having second thoughts about that now. You... Are you, um... He paused, trying to think of the best word to use. Faye? She followed her brows and asked, You mean you really don't know? No, I haven't ever met one that I know of before. But you have the sight. How could I be the first to have ever seen? Eric shrugged. Well, I lived in the city my whole life. This is my first time living out in the woods. Wait, you aren't going to cast some sort of spell on me or something, are you? Her shock was clear, and she whispered, Oh no, I would not dare such a thing. Eric didn't quite know what to make of that, and asked, So, you do have magical powers then? Of a sort, yes, all my kind do. It is nothing compared to that of one of the creator's children, however. Who are they? Eric asked. She gave him a sceptical look, but that soon melted into surprise. You mean you don't know? Truly? I don't, please tell me, he responded. You are? You are one of the creator's children, she said. What's so special about me? he asked. You are a human. So all humans are creator's children? Yes. And all humans are magical? She nodded and replied, yes. He couldn't quite wrap his head around that. But there are accounts of the Fae using magic in almost all the stories we have of you. How can you say we have magic when we can't do any of the things in the stories? She tilted her head to one side, then corrected it before responding. They are not the same kind of magic. Yours is the primal power of creation itself. It is the ability to make the world into what you wish it to be. This is far beyond the magics of my kind. But that doesn't make sense. Wouldn't we know if we were magical? I mean, I can't fly or swim the oceans. Can you not? I have seen many of your kind fly and swim the oceans. No, we use aeroplanes and ships for that. She turned her face toward him again, and raised her hand to shield her eyes. It is so commonplace to you that you no longer see it for the miracle of creation that it is. There is more magic in the world now than there has ever been, if you know where to look for it. Eric scratched his chin and said, That's just technology. There's nothing magical about that. I can't accept that. Humans aren't magical. Believe me or do not, these are only the magics I thought would be obvious to you, however. There are others far more powerful and ancient. A few we even trace back to the origins of the creation itself. Why don't we see those then? You do not see because you do not know where to look. Where should I look then? She took a step towards him and raised a hand. My gifts are of sight and I will help you see. She spoke in a tongue somehow familiar to him but he was sure he had never heard it before. It sounded like something from the Middle East somewhere and from deepest antiquity. When she was done, the darkness of the night lifted, and the entire meadow shone as bright as if it were the midday sun. In front of him she was brilliantly glowing, yet it didn't hurt his eyes. Light rippled over the meadow, and trees were all the colour of the rainbow like it was being reflected off of gentle waters. Wow, he breathed. You are glowing. It's beautiful. She took her hand away from her face and squinted up at his. It is not me, child of the creator. It is you. 
He looked down at his hands. Ribbons of light and energy flowed around and through his body. Streams of smooth golden light with sparkles, and a fierce red band that danced little streams of electricity off of his skin were predominant, though all colours were represented. This is my magic? he asked. No, she responded. That is the magic of others. Your kind of magic manifests on the recipient. So people have been using their magic on me? Since you were in your mother's womb, many of these patterns have marked you and grown with you. They have guided you and formed you into what you are today. Who? What have they been doing to me? She stepped toward him and reached out a hand, gently dipping a finger in one of the streams of energy. This golden one here is from your mother. It has nurtured and healed you. It has comforted and consoled you. This is a power common to mothers, and yours is no exception. What's this red one? he asked, holding his hand closer to his face to look at him more carefully. It seems to wrap around me all over. That red one is from your father, she said, reaching out to touch it. One of the crimson bolts jumped out at her with a snap of electricity, and she pulled her hand quickly back. It is very protective of you, she said with a smile. Not all are so fortunate. I don't understand. How do they do this? How does this magic work? She shrugged. My kind cannot fathom this wonder. You weave this magic into the world and the rest of creation watches and longs for what might have been and what is promised again. Eric looked down into her squinting eyes and asked, What is it you long for? She strained through tears as she whispered, For you to return to whence you fell and become what you were made and empowered to be. And you know what that is? Yes, she breathed. All of my kind were there in the beginning before the rebellion. We saw the world as it was meant to be. We saw and, seeing we now struggle to hope for his return. Creation is broken. It has caused pain and suffering. War and hatred, pestilence and famine. Those of my kind that lose hope turn into things like those hounds you saw before. They lose themselves to hatred of the children and despair for themselves. Eric smiled faintly. But not you. She returned it. No, not yet, and I hope not ever. I trust in the Creator and hope to one day see the restoration of all things, and what new may yet come to pass. You really think we can be that again? The Creator made it possible. I have faith. Eric turned and took a few paces before facing her again. I need to understand more about this magic if I'm going to use it. What else do you see in what surrounds me? I see this one is for your learning, she said pointing to a thin but vibrant green band reaching into his mind and heart. That one is for strength and quickness of mind. Those four here are to encourage and guide you to prosperity. This one is a piece that was woven for the benefit of a group of which you are a part. As she pointed out and identified what she could out the innumerable magics woven over and through him, he began to understand the nature of the magic humans wielded. It was so simple, and something he had taken for granted his entire life. You can stop, he said. I understand now. She rubbed her eyes and closed them, to rest him from the strain of looking at him. What do you understand? Each one of these streams in the weave is from a different person. Each one is someone that has invested in me over my life. My parents nurturing and protecting me. My soccer coach to strengthen me and make me a smart player. My teachers who have invested to teach me about the world. Friends, family... Even leaders and groups have played a part in all of this. I understand what human magic is now, and why we so easily take it for granted. We live in it every day, so it becomes background noise to us. It's funny. It was there all along. What was? She asked, opening her eyes. Love in its many forms. Concern, compassion, kindness, charity. All of these facets are facets of love. I do not understand, she said. I think I understand why, he responded. The natural world doesn't usually have all those things. When we find aspects of it in some places, animals for example, we make them our pets because we understand somewhere deep down that they represent at least a part of what the world was supposed to be. As you are a part of nature, I understand why you don't understand us. We are in so many ways outside the red and tooth and claw that is the natural world. We were created to be something different. He squared his stance to face her fully and said, Do you know why I came out here tonight? 
No. I was going to kill myself. I didn't think anyone cared about me or loved me. I thought I was alone. You opened my eyes to see that was not true. She bowed her head and looked down to the ground at their feet. It would be a tragedy to creation itself if one of the children were lost in such a way. The smallest strand of magic in your weave is more powerful than anything the greatest of our cause could dare attempt. It would be an immeasurable loss. I think I see that now. Thank you. With those words he stepped into the circle and wrapped his arms around her. She stiffened at the embrace at first, but then relaxed and soaked it in. When he began to pull away, she grabbed him and returned the hug. I have not felt the touch of another for a thousand years. Please, just a little longer. What? Why? That is how long I have been trapped here by the Thirteen. She was small and delicate, and colder than Eric thought she would be to the touch. When she was done, she released him, and they pulled away from one another. I forgot how wonderful it was to be held by a friend. Thank you. I hope it will not be another thousand years before I feel that again. You can leave the circle. No, I cannot. To leave is to abandon the only defense I have against those who seek my life. Who are they? he asked. The creator made us fourteen siblings, seven male and seven female. They are my family. She lowered her head, and her voice quieted to a breathy whisper. One by one I watched over the millennia as they fell to despair. I alone of them remain and hold on to hope. Now the rage they have for the children has spilled over onto me. Since they have been unable to turn me, they now seek my life. Eric reached out a hand and gently put a finger under her chin. He lifted her face until she was looking directly into his eyes. I don't think they can harm you anymore. He turned to look at her arm and nodded at it. She looked. A strand of pale blue energy began weaving itself around and through her body. It sparred from time to time with magical essence. You... You have protected me, she sputtered. I am free. Yes, you are. Never lose hope. She bowed and then stepped out of the circle for the first time since before the Crusades. As soon as she did, a low growl rumbled out from the forest and 13 sets of glowing red eyes fixed on them from the shadows. They have been waiting for me to leave the circle for 10 centuries. I don't know if they will be able to resist attacking. What happens if they do? Eric asked. The protection she placed on me will destroy them utterly, she said, a small tear rolling down her cheek. Even after all they have done, I do not wish them to die. Eric looked out into the forest of those creatures and said, I know what it means to lose hope. I had before I came out to this meadow. Is there anything that can be done for them? She looked up at him with sad eyes. Nothing I know can reverse the transformation. It was only then he noticed she was no longer squinting. Does it not hurt to look at me anymore? Her eyes widened and she exclaimed, No, it doesn't. What happened? He smiled at her and said, It must be magic. Before they reached the woods, the wolves all charged out of the forest towards them. Far from alarm, the both of them simply watched the black creatures approach. Eric looked at his companion and saw her face contorted with sorrow and pity. He knew he had to try something. He stepped forward and stretched out a hand towards them and said, I'm sorry. Streams of magic wrapped around each of them and picked them up off the ground. I'm sorry we haven't been doing our job. I'm sorry we have brought so much pain and suffering into the world. I'm sorry, above all else, that we have given you reason to lose hope. Please, give us another chance to earn your trust. As part of creation, I understand now how important you are, and I will care for you. Please, walk away from your despair and take your place in this world. One by one, they stopped struggling against the magic that bound them. When the last had gone still, the blackness seemed to almost congeal and drip off of them. When it was done, what was left were six women and seven men of the Fey standing before the two of them. Tears were streaming around Eric's companion's face as she said, My brothers and sisters, how long I wept for your loss. Now a day I never dared dream of has come, and we are reunited once more. They came together and joined hands, and greeted one another. The siblings all turned to face Eric, and each of the former walls, now a tiaras of golden magical energy, encircling their heads like crowns. One of the men stepped forward and said, 
thank you, child of the Creator. You have saved us from despair, and we will forever be grateful. May we never lose faith again. With that, they all walked into the forest, and a mist rose to greet them. Before she left, his new fae friend turned and smiled warmly at him. She bowed, and stepped back into the swelling vapours and disappeared. When the fog dissipated, they were gone. All Eric could do was stand there dumbfounded for a time. Eventually, he noticed the light he was radiating was dimming. Her enchantment allowing him to see magic was beginning to wear off. Taking advantage of what light was left, he ran to retrieve his father's pistol and made his way back home. Aided by the glow, he was much faster to get home than it had been on the way out. When he rounded a bend in the driveway and came within sight of the house, he saw his mum waiting by a window. She yelled something into the house behind her and soon burst out the front door, running towards him. He walked towards her and she nearly knocked him over with a hug when she reached him. Oh, Eric, I was so worried. You went out and when your father couldn't find his pistol, we thought... Well, we thought you might have done something. He hugged her back, and in the fading enchantment saw the myriad layers of magic she had accumulated over her lifetime. He wondered which one was his, and decided to make it stronger every chance he got. Over his mum's shoulder, he saw his dad come out the door. He was an overweight man, and he lumbered in a sort of half-walk, half-jog down the driveway toward them. His arms were soon added to the embrace, and he said, You had me us worried, son. With all the things you've been going through lately, we thought you may have... His father's voice caught in his throat, and he squeezed tighter. I know, I was in a dark place, but I came through it. Without letting go, his dad asked. You sure, son? Yeah, dad, I'm sure. His mum asked him, what got you past it? With his head bowed and smashed into his parents' shoulders, he said, I realised how much you guys and others love me, and it put a lot of things into perspective. What helped you see that? His mother asked. It was something I found in the woods. His father straightened up a little, and looking at him asked, What did you find out there? He smiled and said, A uniquely human magic. <laughs>